So um, welcome everybody. This is Wednesday, the 22nd um, General Housing and Military Affairs Committee meeting. We are taking up in the first uh, portion of our meeting S333, which has been the rental moratorium. We will officially have possession of this at some point, hopefully in the next 24 hours or so, I did do the floor work. Um, we'll, we'll be on the floor later on this afternoon, the, the floor um, later on this afternoon. And um, actually, no, I'm sorry, we're not on the floor tomorrow. We're that, t t today is the caucus stuff that, that their bills will be explained from three to four. And then tomorrow we'll be on the floor and, and I imagine we'll get possession of the bill then. Um, at which point hopefully we'll have finished our work on this and be able to vote it right back out so that it can be on the floor and then next week and then back to the Senate so that we can um, make this, get this into law as soon as we possibly can. So with us today, we have Wendy Morgan from Vermont Legal Aid and Sue Steckel, who is a, who is a real estate attorney or is an attorney who brought us um, the information last week about uh, the, the potential hole about the foreclosure of vacant buildings and um, Vermont Legal Aid has brought up a, a issue that's related to that. And so I invited them in to talk, I think. And then and then we have the attorney, David Hall here to go through the changes. So they're not quite as simple as they were last week, but these are the proposals from the advocates on, um, on evening this out. So I'll pass the microphone to Wendy first. And again, um, if, if you are participating in the meeting and you see the hand up and you want to have, ask a question, please feel free to put your hand up and I will get to you when there's, a, when there's an opening as if we were in a regular meeting. And um, if you do feel like leaving chat messages uh, through the chat function on Zoom, make sure that it's addressed to all um, just in order to keep an open meeting open. So Wendy, please um, just let, if you could let the committee know uh, basically where this language, not only the language about the foreclosures, but the language about the mobile homes came forward. Um, I would appreciate it if you could just um, share your thoughts about how it came up. Okay. So thank you very much for having me, Wendy Morgan from Vermont Legal Aid. Um, you will recall that on the 14th, you had testimony from Representative Marcotte and others about the need to allow foreclosures to go forward if there was a uh, if the building was vacant and that you didn't that you didn't want to slow those down completely. Um, so the proposal that David put forward to you um, that day and that you discussed uh, indicated that you would completely exempt out any uh, foreclosure of a of a building that was not occupied by the um, mortgagor. Um, the problem with that language and just using the word vacant is that Vermont Legal Aid's experience in the past has been that there have been times when particularly out of state um, mortgage holders proceeded against a building in which they thought, which they thought was vacant and was not in fact vacant. Um, so we worked, um, and, and that's a particular concern right now because you could easily have somebody who is hospitalized or you could have somebody who is sheltering in place at another location, either because they're helping somebody else out or they're needing to be helped out. Um, so that was our concern with regards to just using the word vacant um, or not occupied. So we got together, we being Jean Murray and I got together with Sue and her colleague, Betsy Glynn. I think I have that name right. Um, and worked up the language that we then sent to your committee. That would take out the change in the definition of foreclosure, but would add um, areas of foreclosure or procedures that are part of the foreclosure process that would be allowed under this bill. And that's very similar to what you're doing in the uh, eviction situation where you allow evictions to go forward to a certain extent, but then there are processes put in place that you can and cannot do. So that was the effort in those areas. Um, 
And frankly, the uh, mobile home parks was our negligence and not thinking about it earlier. Um, I don't think we would have come forward and asked you to make the change if you weren't going to make a change and send the bill back to the Senate anyway. But we realized as we were looking carefully uh, and talking with Sue and Betsy that that was uh, something that we had simply neglected to include in the original bill. So that's why um, we added the mobile home residents at, that the moratorium would apply to mobile home residents the way it applies to other residents, people who are lease, lease uh, not sorry, renting properties. So now, it, it, but that for the for mobile homes, um, the preponderance of the homes themselves are owned by the individuals. And just to be clear, is that this is what makes mobile homes difficult to to, to wrap our heads around a lot, and a lot of times it's not as simple as a rental unit because they're renting, they're renting the pad upon which their home sits. That's um, often, but they also there are also mobile homes that are rented as well. That's right. that's what we're getting at right here, right? Well, so the rented mobile homes uh, would be would come in under the irregular eviction law because that's just under landlord tenant law. But the, when you are renting the lot, that's not in landlord tenant law. So that's why we wanted to make sure that they would be included here too. Uh, mobile home law, it's in three different places as far as I can tell. Um, Representative Triano. Yes. Um, so, uh, in the in the event that someone um, owns a mobile home on a rented lot and has a mortgage on the mobile home, I'm assuming that the language that is in this bill would protect them under both instances. In other words, from a foreclosure on their mobile home as well as an eviction from their mobile home site that is rented. Is that safe I, to say? I believe that's correct, yes. Okay, thank you. All right, and just a note, I, I'm, instead of saying you can unmute yourself, anybody who gets called on here has their hand up, please just unmute yourself because I just got into a thing with Chip where he unmuted, I muted him, and, and, you know, but just, um, so John, I don't need to tell you. Wendy, thank you. Um, I see that Angela from Vermont Landlord Association has uh, agreed totally with the mobile home thing. Did she check in on this other aspect that you are putting in an amendment on? Because everything we're working so closely together, I just want to make sure the field, as we as we've learned in this, is is all together on your your issue around foreclosures. Yeah, thank you for the question, um, uh, Angela. At Zykowski and Nadine Siebert both said, we're good on the mobile homes. We don't have anything to do with foreclosures. Okay. Basically, so. Great, thank you. All right. Um, anything else for Wendy right at this minute? Um, again, we'll hear from Sue and then we'll take a quick review of the language. Um, all right, Wendy, I'm going to you for a minute and then, um, and then we'll go to Sue. So Sue, welcome to the General Housing and Military Affairs Committee. We only met you through your email last week and your concerns last week. Um, and if you could just, um, I, not necessarily go over what we went over with Christelia last week, but just sort of give your impressions on on how this came about and, and how this language is right now to you. Surely, I'll be happy to. Um, just quickly by way of background, um, my practice consists primarily of um, mortgage foreclosures, both commercial and res residential mortgage foreclosures. Um, I represent community-based banks that have a brick and mortar presence here in Vermont, um, all of whom are extremely busy trying to work with their customers now, whether it's on a commercial loan or a residential loan. Um, anyone being impacted by COVID is, um, applying for and the banks are scrambling to find um, forbearance programs, deferrals, modifications, um, whatever they can really do to help their customers through this period. Um, <clears throat> the concern, and, and I apologize being late to the table, I was not aware that the bill was as far reaching as it was. And initially, um, I had just thought that the, the bill covered actual evictions in foreclosure actions, the actual 
last step of getting a rid of possession, serving it, and removing somebody from a house. And that's something that during the state of emergency, the courts are not allowing, my clients are not asking for it. I'm, um, I wouldn't do it if they asked me to do it during this state of emergency. Um, so that was something that um, I and the other um, local foreclosure attorneys who do not represent the larger um, financial institutions uh, thought was not a problem. Um, in looking further at the definitions in the statute, um, I became concerned that um, foreclosures would completely halt on vacant properties. Um, and this is a time when that could be especially problematic for health and safety because um, some of those vacant properties are in horrendous shape. Um, they're falling apart. They've frozen over during the winter. They're infested with rodents and vermin. Um, garbage has not been disposed of. Uh, squatters are, are um, taking over some of the properties. There's vandalism going on. Um, I, I've had examples with vacant properties of really horrendous types of things. Um, all of the appliances and pipes being removed. Um, I've had instances where um, uh, squatters have actually torn siding off of a building and burned it outside the building so that it was completely destroyed. Um, so this is a period, and, and many of these vacant properties are properties that are abandoned that, um, whether it be a commercial property or a residential property, the mortgagor has said, um, for whatever reason, I can't afford this property, I don't want the property, bank, please take it. And, um, and that happens more often than not. Um, my particular concern um, was in, with vacant properties that have um, progressed to the point where the, pro the property has already been sold at an auction and we're waiting for the court to confirm the sale and to close. Um, in those cases, um, no one is harmed by proceeding with that confirmation and closing. And in fact, in many cases, it helps the mortgagor because there might be surplus proceeds that are going to the mortgagor. There might be surplus proceeds that are going to a subordinate lien holder on the property. Um, and in any event, if there is going to be a deficiency that the mortgagor owes, the sooner that property can get sold and closed, the lower that deficiency amount is going to be. Um, for the most part in residential foreclosures, the local banks don't pursue deficiencies anyway, but it becomes a big issue um, when you're looking at a, um, a commercial loan because there are guarantors and there are deficiencies. Uh, the other, um, the other aspect here is that I think we're at least legal aid and um, the foreclosure attorneys are in agreement that this bill shouldn't cover commercial mortgages, but I don't think we've actually said that anywhere. And so that's the other item that um, the local banks are looking to have clarified um, is that a commercial mortgage could proceed through foreclosure. Um, where legal aid and the foreclosing attorneys, Betsy Glenn and myself in our conversation are in agreement is the specific language proposed to allow confirmation hearings, foreclosure sales and closings on the vacant properties to go forward. Where we still um, do have a disagreement is whether um, whether occupied property, unoccupied property foreclosures, excuse me, should be halted or whether they should be allowed to proceed. And I think if we only use the defined term of dwelling house without reference to whether or not it's occupied, then even someone who has stipulated, who has come to the bank and has said, here are the keys, please foreclose, 
doesn't get the relief, the bank doesn't get the relief, that individual doesn't get the relief, um, the neighborhood doesn't get the relief of having the foreclosure move forward and having this potential health and safety hazard removed. Um, in talking with some clients yesterday that uh, the term dwelling house potentially could encompass some commercial loans. For example, um, I have one foreclosure with a, a corporate developer that has completed or partially completed spec houses. They're vacant, they've never, never been occupied. Certificates of occupancy have not been issued. Um, the loan's been in default for a long time. Extensions have been granted, those have run out. So the default and the problem is not related to COVID and will not be fixed when this emergency is over. Um, those are foreclosures that we believe should be allowed to proceed. Okay. Um, we have a question here from Representative Triano. Hold on, Chip. So, okay. You, we can hear you. No, we lost you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's working great. <laughs> um, so there's a clear distinction between the dwelling or the the whole houses, let's say, that you're describing that are run down and full of uh, rodents, and what Wendy has described to us as a building or a home or house that may be vacant because someone is somewhere else. So I'm thinking in terms of that, there, we're, are we looking to craft language that would accommodate or to, uh, to um, describe uh, both of these situations or distinguish both of these situations so that we're not um, allowing foreclosures on a home that could be occupied otherwise <clears throat> and homes that are uh, um, uh, abandoned and, um, and about to be given up for foreclosure. It seems to me that we need to make a distinguishing, uh, uh, to distinguish between those two entities at this point, at least from what I'm hearing from the two of you. That's an excellent question. And I actually spent some time yesterday morning trying to compile a list of those types of things and I concluded at the end that really um, it's up to the court to look at the factors. When I have a, when I have a property such as this, um, I would also be asking for a shortened redemption period from the court. And I would include a sworn statement um, from somebody who has been there um, and photos, if I can, that would actually show the condition of the property. And then at that point, it's up to the court to make the determination. And I've had cases where um, I, I've thought that the property was vacant and the court has pushed back and said, no, I'd like a little bit more before I make that determination. Um, so I do think um, the courts have wide discretion in foreclosure actions. And I do think that they will use that discretion appropriately um, if asked to declare a property unoccupied, especially during these difficult times. So proceedings such as you have just described to us, is that routine throughout the uh, business? Um, are most attorneys practicing that way? Can you tell us? Absolutely. I, I have never, and I, I frequently um, represent junior lien holders in foreclosures that are started um, by the larger out-of-state servicers who do not physically actually see the property. And in my experience, they have treated all properties as occupied. Um, and they have actually, um, many of these lenders have actually been chastised by the courts for not requesting writs of possession for the court. And they may have to file um, an eviction action later on um, because they haven't done it timely. I, I just don't see the larger servicers doing that. And if they would 
you know, if they would start doing that, I believe that our courts would um, hold their feet to the fire and ask them to prove it. And I believe that the, the judges would sanction them if they submitted, you know, knowingly false or misleading statements. Okay, thank you. Wendy, was that, an, uh, were you raising your hand there? Yes, I, I just have to say that I am totally baffled by this testimony because I had understood um, that after the negotiation session that the words that I sent to Tom were agreeable to the uh, to Betsy and to Sue and Jean and me, and I was not in on all of the negotiations, but this is quite different from what I have understood our agreements to be. So I'm, I'm, I apologize for taking your time if we hadn't gotten there, but I was assured that by email from Sue that they agreed to the language that I sent you, which cut out the uh, vacancy or um, not occupied language in the definition. As and long I, as they got to be able to do the rest of the things that we included in C1, as I recall it is. And I, I honestly, um, it, I think there was a miscommunication there. And I, you know, I will take full responsibility for that because I thought we were focusing on the specific language about the confirmation hearings. And I frankly, to be honest, I, I think I missed that Wendy struck the word unoccupied because I felt that that was an issue that we hadn't really resolved. We had agreed on the confirmation piece, but not, um, not entirely to say only confirmations could go forward because that could potentially mean if the state of emergency continues for months, that could potentially mean that um, only a few properties that have already been sold and are waiting for confirmation could move forward, but it could be months, even years before some of these other vacant properties could move forward if they haven't reached that stage yet. Um, and I do apologize for any misunderstanding there. And uh, I, I, there are certain pe certainly pieces there that um, Wendy and Jean and Betsy and I were in agreement on. Um, but we felt that this committee should address the occupancy versus vacancy. Okay, I'm gonna go to uh, Representative Kalaki. Thank you. Uh, Sue, I just wanna make sure I'm understanding uh, what, what you're asking us to consider because I thought Chris had said in his testimony from the Bankers Association that no banks currently are do, moving on evictions or foreclosures. And that I know Helen, Judge Helen Tour in Chittenden County has put a stay on these and four other counties have now done this in the state because there's, the courts aren't doing in-person meetings. So I, I, I'm really not sure like how this all works currently if the system, if, if evictions and foreclosures aren't moving, what's the issue? I think the issue is pending foreclosures where there's a redemption period or where there are pending motions that the court needs to decide. Um, and again, foreclosures that are not opposed would still move forward. And commercial for foreclosures are still moving forward to the extent that um, workout options have been exhausted and or um, the business is closed permanently and the mortgagor is not interested or is unable to maintain or sell the property. And, and those are moving forward through the banking system and the judicial systems, even though five counties have said they're not gonna do this? I, well, it, I don't think, the counties have said that they won't issue, the counties have said they won't issue writs of possession. Okay. And a writ of possession is, would be, you know, really just the last step if there's, if there's an individual living in a house. Okay. And and we are we are in agreement with that absolutely. Well, I think the I believe for our committee the intention of this bill was about residential. Right? It's not it's not commercial properties. We're really we we've, we've been talking mm -hmm. about we well but the other thing to keep in mind I think that the fine line here too John is is and Sue is this idea that is 
there can be a commercial mortgage with residences inside that that i think that was the original concept behind considering this is is this portion of it was saying was saying we don't want a property foreclosed upon where people will lose their homes i mean so it's a commercial loan it's not just a residential mortgage is that i mean did, did i hear am i remembering this right from our month long conversation on this is that is that that's we understand that there is a there is a group there of commercial loans that can affect residencies. And I understand we're trying to find, do, I thought we had settled this in terms of what was occupied property or unoccupied property. And, and meaning that if, if there was an apartment house with a, with a commercial property down below, that if it was totally empty and vacant, then that foreclosure, if that process was already ongoing, that it would be allowed to go as long as people weren't losing their, losing their homes. Can I speak a little bit further to that as well? Um, it, the federal government um, in 2018 uh, passed the Permanently Protecting Tenants at Foreclosure Act. And as a result of that act, a mortgage lender, whether it's a residential or a commercial lender, residential or commercial loan, cannot obtain a writ of possession to evict a tenant. Um, it, it, you know, it doesn't matter if that tenant was, was there and has a lease, or even if it's an oral month to month lease, the owner of the property must give a 90 day notice and the owner being whoever buys the property after a foreclosure sale must honor the lease. If it's a written lease to the end of the lease. And if it's a month to month lease, must give a 90 day notice, and then they would have to follow up with a separate eviction action. So evictions of residential tenants are not happening in foreclosures. Um, they're against the law. Well, there's only a, but you're saying there's a 90 day window there. After, okay. after the foreclosure is over, after the four, the 90 days would be after the foreclosures over and the property has been sold at an auction to a new owner. That new owner is the one who has to send, uh, first send a 90 day notice and then they would have to file an action against the tenant. And I find that most, in most cases, if they're good tenants, um, my clients will sell the property subject to the tenancies and the owners will as long as the tenants let them in to see the property, the owners will talk with them and they will keep them there. Um, but, but they would not be evicted through a writ of possession in a foreclosure action. Okay. Representative Triano. <laughs> You're muted still. Yes. Okay. Yes. So again, I'm thinking in terms of a dilapidated property that is that where the whole community would benefit from um, uh, foreclosure or a change of hands. You know, foreclosure doesn't doesn't indicate at all that that property will not will change in any way because the bank then has to sell the derelict property um, and to a landlord or a person who would be willing to uh, to uh, fix it up. Um, so. You know, I'm thinking in terms of maybe adding a, a, a permanently unoccupied or something of that nature that would distinguish uh, between the properties that you described, Sue, and the properties that Wendy has described to us. And I think that we left commercial properties out of this, though at least any language referring to them, uh, in order to uh, give some clarification that um, we are, they're not, straight commercial properties are not, uh, are not included in this. Uh, but, you know, I mean, the five counties that, out of 14 that have um, ruled uh, on these 90-day uh, delays, um, one of the problems that we find is that um, the language is not consistent, nor is it um, uh, very clear. So um, one of the reasons that we, you know, are taking this bill up is to add clarity and consistency throughout the state um, when, if any of these actions do uh, make it to court. Um, so I, you know, I think that um, we should be able to, to distinguish between the, uh, an absolute derelict property 
um, and a property that um, may be uh, temporarily vacant. I don't know if that goes anywhere, but that's my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think abandonment is certainly a factor. Um, uh, abandonment and, and agreement, uh, agreement of the mortgagor that, you know, I don't want it, take it. <laughs> Oh, that could play into it as well. I, I would I would not disagree with that. Hey, uh, Wendy. So I'm just wondering. I mean, given that we did have agreement in writing from Sue that the proposals that we put forth were acceptable, I wonder if we should proceed or you should proceed um, with those, and then if we need to make a modification later, we do that, but not bog down this bill at this point in time, given that we would have worked more if we'd realized that there was a problem. So that, and I see that Senator Balint is on. I have no idea if, if they're ready for you or what, but that, well, that's the, the next step of, The next step for the conversation, and welcome, uh, welcome to the conversation, um, Senator Ballant and Senator Hooker was here, I believe as well at one point. Um, uh, David, if David Hall is here, I'd like to pull him in just to show um, the language that we're at too. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of timing, you know, we're getting to be up against it if we want this thing to pass anytime soon, because this is our last meeting this week. Um, the expectation was that by the end of this meeting, we would have once again wrapped the spill up um, as we did last week. And then um, once we had full possession of the bill that we would try to um, vote on it and have it ready for the floor uh, next week. And, you know, we have very limited time next week in order to get this back to the Senate. And we don't want the, we, we want this bill to be as done as we, we don't, we, we want to be able to concur uh, or have the Senate concur when this language is done. So, um, so David, if you could just give us a quick, well, I'll say quick, but I'll take what, what, however long it takes. Um, the rundown of the language that was proposed and, and what we shared with the committee, um, maybe starting with the mobile home because there seems to be no controversy over the mobile home language, and then show us what we thought we had an agreement with coming into today's meeting. That would be great. Sure. Uh, can you see me and hear me okay? You, yeah, your head is like, looks like <laughs> a golf ball. Here, there you go. Sorry. That's, that's better. I'm in my bedroom, so I'm trying to minimize the uh, amount of exposure here. <laughs> We're I, yeah, I see. I see that the language there. So, um, are you going to share the screen? Yes. Okay. And welcome, Senator Clarkson, and welcome, Senator Sorokin. You're on mute. Um, uh, this is the as pass Senate. Just a moment. I'm sorry. And just quickly, Senate, just to catch you up, um, they're just we're going to about to see the language that I um, that has been worked on up to a point, and we understand that there may be some difficulty with some of it right now. But um, David's going to share these two amendments. Okay, so for your record, David Hall, Legislative Council, this is S-333 right now entitled an act relating to establishing a moratorium on ejectment and foreclosure actions during the COVID-19 emergency. So as you know, the bill came over from the Senate, um, been uh, not yet referred to House General as I understand, but will be imminently um, I want to I want to remind you that the last time I met with you in this committee and Representative Marcotte was involved and Chris Delia as well. Uh, you'll recall we talked about a change um, to the definition uh, <clears throat> um, that referred to uh, a, for, a property to which was being foreclosed upon and we added, uh, you know, that is occupied at the end of that definition. So um, sort of in the universe of S-333, if we're thinking about the foreclosure half of that bill, it would have affected the entire bill structure so that all of the pieces threaded throughout it um, that refer to foreclosure would no longer apply to unoccupied properties. And um, 
So that was a change that you, as the committee seemed comfortable with before. Um, this is narrower than that. Um, there are two proposals of amendment here. The first one is in section one, subdivision A2. This relates to the ejectment piece and it just simply uh, specifies 10 VSA chapter 153 and mobile home park residents just to be sure that they're included in the moratorium on ejectments. So I think this is fine. It certainly doesn't change the substance of the bill. Ejectment procedures ultimately you'd have to go through 12 VSA 169 anyway. So I, I think this is a good catch, uh, harmless, and uh, just make sure that loose end is tied up. But the second piece relates back to where we began, which is the foreclosure piece. And um, specifically, you recall subdivision C1 of the bill was uh, addresses, um, uh, I have an ask from Senator Brock. Ron, you've got that. Um, addresses uh, ejectment of, new for, ejectment and foreclosure actions. And uh, remember that we're hitting pause on all of these actions in the underlying S33, 333. So this new language starting on line 11 would, so would make a carve out to the blanket moratorium and would say that notwithstanding the blanket pause we're hitting during the emergency period on these actions, this subsection, subsection does not stay a foreclosure sale, a motion for confirmation, or a confirmation order concerning an unoccupied property. So let me break that down for you in plain English. Um, again, under the bill, uh, both pending and new ejectment and foreclosure actions would be paused during the emergency period as we've defined it, then this creates a narrow exception that says, notwithstanding the pause, the moratorium on foreclosures, we will allow these three things to proceed. And they are all narrow. They all relate to a judicial sale um, in a foreclosure action. And they say, if the foreclosure sale was happening, it can keep happening if the property is unoccupied. If a sale happened, then the parties go back to the court for this motion for confirmation. And that's where the court gives its stamp of approval for a sale that has occurred. So if it's an unoccupied property, foreclosure sale has happened, you go back to the court, you ask for this motion for confirmation, the court can still give you that, grant that motion. And then the confirmation order, very similarly, it's one of the final step where the, the court orders, confirms the sale is done. Everybody's dotted their I's, uh, crossed their T's. This is over with. Proceed with sending out whatever proceeds, whatever papers need to happen to complete uh, that sale and the transfer of the property um again if it's unoccupied so and david just quick are these for proceedings are these still for proceedings that were underway prior to the beginning of the emergency period i mean this is what i think we were talking about last week was that if there were any if there were any proceedings that were going under that were underway prior to the beginning of the emergency period that they would be allowed to these foreclosures that would be allowed to go forward does this does this does this exempt or stop that and make it so that any foreclosure that's happening during the emergency period can go on as business as usual I, i'm gonna i want to make sure i'm answering the right question so would you mind saying that again our original consideration last week of this of this concept that we were trying to 
allow we were trying the way i understand the way i remember it is that we were trying to allow foreclosure proceedings on vacant properties or unoccupied properties that were already underway prior to the emergency declaration would be allowed to continue and does this change that or does this allow all foreclosure any foreclosure that's going on to operate under these under these conditions that, that are proposed I think the answer is no and no. I, I think, are you are you asking me how this differs from the language that the committee tacitly approved last week, last meeting? Well, the and the intent that went, that went behind it, which was to say if there was something going on prior to the, the declaration that it would be allowed to continue as long as it was, right. un, unless it was a vacant property, uh, then, I mean, it could continue if it was a vacant property. Okay, so, um, so what you have today is much narrower than what you had last hearing. So let's start with S33, 333 as it came from the Senate. Um, it said, all pending actions and all new actions are paused, right? Mm -hmm. That's whether it was pending at the time the emergency period began or it is new during the emergency period. And remember in that latter circumstance, while you would be allowed to initiate an action by filing, it would immediately be stayed upon the date of filing. So whether it was already underway or it was new during the emergency period, the effect of 333 was to hit pause. The change that you all considered previously, um, so where you, you uh, seemed comfortable with changing the definition of foreclosure to say it's a foreclosure action against a dwelling house that is occupied, right? That's what mm -hmm. you had, everybody kind of shook their head. They're okay with that. Mm -hmm. That would have applied throughout this bill. And the change that would make would be that whether it was pending or whether it's new, if it's a foreclosure action against an unoccupied property, it could proceed obviously subject to the court's own status, but as far as this bill is concerned, foreclosure actions against unoccupied properties, whether pending or new, would have been unaffected by this bill. So that was a okay. pretty broad change. So again, this language in the amendment you have in front of you in the second instance says that in a pending sale, a foreclosure sale, I mean, excuse me, in a pending foreclosure action, if it's an unoccupied property, a foreclosure sale, a motion for confirmation or a confirmation order could proceed as far as this bill is concerned. So does everybody sort of understand the scope here? Uh, yes, and I guess, um, let me go to, I have two questions lined up, David, um, Representative Triano. Yes, it was, that was my understanding, David, is that, um, that both pending and new actions would be stayed throughout this entire bill to include um, actions against unoccupied dwellings. That's correct. I, I, I'm not sure I'm following your question, I'm sorry. So my understanding that both uh, new actions against foreclosure or eviction uh, and pending actions would both be stayed uh, throughout this entire bill in all sections and to include um, unoccupied dwellings. 
that is the current state of S-333 as it came from the Senate. Yes. Right. Okay. So, so the Marcotte proposal of amendment yes. would have made a carve out across the board for unoccupied properties. Right. That's the Marcotte proposal. Right. Okay. And this narrowing of it is what was agreed to, or we we thought was agreed to as of yesterday. And I don't see Sue, but I see Wendy. Um, so, um, all right, I'm gonna go to Representative Hengo. You can unmute yourself, Lisa. Yeah, I tried the space bar thing, but it didn't work. I'm sorry. Um, so this new amendment, then David would um, affect unoccupied property, but only those unoccupied properties that were pending at the time of the state of emergency. Nothing new in terms of unoccupied property could be pursued until the state of emergency is over. Is that correct? That is correct. And in fact, it is actually limited a little bit further than that. If you really want to uh, dig into the language on line 11, not only uh, limited to pending actions, but pending actions that are already at the stage or of foreclosure sale motion for confirmation or confirmation and order. So they're at the very end, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess my question or concern is narrowing it so much. And I know that's not a question for you, David, that's for everyone else. So I'm just throwing that question out there. Um, cause I really did believe that we were in agreement when we heard the amendment last time we met. Thank you. So a quick question then for, um, for Wendy and or Sue, um, Reiterate to us once again why the language from last week, why that's, I mean, it was a simple change, right? It was one or two words. Um, why was that objectionable? And I'll go to Wendy first. You're unmuted. So Wendy, why, why, why strike the language and then add this language again? Can you, can you reiterate that for me, please? I can't hear you. Can you unmute yourself? There you go, right there. Okay, great. I guess my mouse pad isn't sensitive enough. Um, so the concern for us was the term unoccupied and Sue has said that the courts will decide but the courts will decide based on some affidavit that somebody puts in that the person who is actually occupying the unit and not there at the moment may not know about it, may not even know the, that, that that's happening. So that's our concern. And it comes not just, it's not just theoretical. Legal Aid is not doing a lot of foreclosures now, but several years ago we had uh, a grant to do foreclosures and we did a lot of them. And occasionally what happened was, particularly with out of state um, companies uh, that wanted to foreclose, they started procedures against a place that was in fact occupied. And I think particularly now that that's a possibility given that people may be, as I said earlier, hospitalized or, or, or sheltering in place someplace else. That was, our, that was the only reason that we, um, had concerns about what you were looking at and thought that we had an agreement. We did have an agreement um, with the uh, foreclosed attorneys who do foreclosures. All right, so um, 
And, and if I can review with you, Sue, um, I mean, you seem to have brought up two different things, Sue. This was, is, is this language sufficient or is it not sufficient? And, and, and then I heard, I thought I heard you say, and there's this other thing that concerned you about the, about commercial foreclosures. And so I'm just curious to know whether or not this language itself was this in, do you now agree with this particular language or, or is this too narrow? Um, I would say we, the answer to, to both there is yes, that that language is, is fine and that was agreed to, um, but we believe that it's too narrow. And I, I apologize for, um, for what, I, I think it. I think it was my miscommunication um, with Wendy because I was focusing on this language and this. You know, this was very specific and made um, specific procedures very clear to the court. And the reason we asked for this specific language is because um, some of my clients have three or four pending similar cases, and one um, when it's confirmed and closed. The mortgagor is going to get some money, so everybody's kind of desperate to make that happen, and it would just be a tragedy for it to not happen. So my thought was, this is this is language that everyone can agree on, but Betsy and I and our respective clients do not think that it goes far enough because foreclosure, even with a vacant property, takes so long to get to the foreclosure sale. Um, even if everyone is cooperating, the courts are swamped and they will be even more swamped now because they have people working from home, they're short staffed, they're dealing with emergency matters. So it could be if I filed a foreclosure tomorrow on an unoccupied property, it could be six months to a year before we would actually get to a foreclosure sale. Um, the definition of emergency period, I think, is what is giving um, most of the banks and foreclosing attorneys cause for concern because the concern is if Governor Scott extends the emergency, let's say for a, a year, but there are only limited provisions left, um, large gatherings of over 250 people, technically, all of our foreclosures would still be stayed. We couldn't start a new foreclosure, even if the property is vacant, without having to come back to the legislature and say, um, okay, we need an amendment to this statute. And, and those are the real fears. People aren't rushing to foreclose now other than um, in cases where uh, the properties are clearly abandoned or the mortgage or has said, move forward, please. Well, I, 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 understand, I understand the difficulty. I mean, what an emergency period is, is something that's brand new to all of us. And exactly. so trying to come up with, with what that means. And yes, it puts fear into a lot of people because it's more unknowing. We get that. We are, but we are also, you know, this is also not a change to underlying statute, right? This is an emer this is emergency legislation that's supposed to be diminished and go away once the emergency period is over. Now, how that breaks down in terms of the emergency period is almost over or parts of it are over. I, you know, yes, we may have to come back and 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 keep re uh, realign the language so that it represents what the reality is. I think what's frustrating is that is is real life for people and what their interests are. And 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 I appreciate that. But we're you know again we're trying to you know the bulk of this is to make sure that people aren't being put out on the streets and trying to do it in a way that also understands. Um, that that people have other financial and business interests in those properties themselves and so we're just again it's um we hear your frustration we have it too um and so i'm just gonna um i'm gonna let my comments go off representative hango you have a comment 
for a question. <clears throat> Yes, thank you. I'm still trying to sort this out and I'll apologize ahead of time. My um, legal vocabulary is fairly limited. So I'm trying to piece this together. I hear what Wendy is saying. My, my gut reaction to that is it's a little too narrow for, for what we need right now. Um, but Sue, I'm, I apologize. I'm just not getting whether you are a proponent or an opponent of the second instance of amendment. And that's all I need is a simple answer. Do you like the wording or not? I heard two different things, sorry. Okay. Yes, the wording here, uh, second, provided this subsection does not stay a foreclosure sale, a motion for confirmation or a confirmation order concerning unoccupied property. Uh, yes, that language was discussed and agreed to. Yes, I'm a proponent of that language. Thank you. So, um, so that just leaves us in a place where, um, well, actually, before I even start there, David, there was one other, so th while this is showing amendments, David, um, there was, was the word unoccupied st struck or was there, um, was there another piece of language that was in brackets? Did we settle that piece? Um, there was a second, if you, I think, are you referring to the piece further below concerning um, new foreclosure and ejectment actions? Is this what you're talking about? Yeah, not not in this not in this page of the not on this page of amendment, but back in the last version of three thirty three, we there was some bracketed material. Um, Th that it had to do with timing, I think. Um, I don't have it in front of me, so are, I can't. Are you, what, what are you seeing? What are you seeing on the screen right now? Are you seeing subsection D with green language? No, I, I'm personally seeing the okay. amendment. All right. I, I'm sorry. I, the reason being that I'm, I'm, sh I'm still sharing the uh, the old. I had pulled. Do you see this now? Yes, that's exactly what okay. I was talking about. I, I had pulled this up. I thought you were seeing it, and um, you are not. So just in my just, dreams, David. Sorry. Quickly, then, that means you also weren't looking at this when uh, Wendy and Sue were speaking. So just to refresh your memory, this is the change to foreclosure that we had discussed. Remember? Yes. We added that is occupied. Yes, that was what we thought was the simple solution a week ago. Right. Uh, and then the second piece was in subsection D. Um, again, this was our, this was the timing issue that you're referring to. Um, as I had explained previously, right now, um, there's, there's sort of the uh, emergency period dating back to March 13th. And then there is the new stuff that occurs after this act takes effect. This, this piece in D is just to give clarity that um, the, the, the subsection D, things that occur during the emergency period after the effective date of this act um, can be initiated, these new actions, subject to it's only by filing, it's stayed immediately, there's no service, and then the 60-day service window is extended from the end. So this was that small timing piece that I frankly think is built in suspenders, but I'm fine with. Okay, so um, committee, this is where we are right now. Um, we have the choices to um, either accept the amendments that were pre presented today, one or both of them. Um, but again, I think I think we agreed tacitly agreed that the that this particular piece here in D that last week we said that that's fine. So we can conceivably take the brackets off of that and the highlighting off of that. And then um, and then the question is that um, on this other language that was presented today and, you know, to, it is not our, um, you know, it is not our intent to keep, and I don't think it's anybody's intent to, to slow this down. I would say that that what's on the table for us is the amendment, the amendments that were provided today, um, the concerns that Sue brought up for further stuff, I would propose that we um, 
continue you know get more information on it because i i would like to be able to i would like to be able to um um be i'd like to this bill to come as much to a conclusion as we possibly can get and if and, and i think with everything else that's going on i think we, we if there are details that are that that do create such a tangle um that we would come back and be able to work on them later we are going to be in session in some way shape or form for quite some time, you know, on maybe on a part-time basis between now and, and sometime in the summer. So there's going to be time for us to figure all of this out, I think, rather than get it perfect right now. Representative Hango. Oh, I guess I'm already unmuted. Thank you. Um, I, I feel very confident that adding mobile home park resident in the first instance of amendment is um, very straightforward. I'm still really unclear about the second instance of amendment and I feel like we need some input from the judiciary on that um, because some of it and some of um, what attorney Steckel was saying really pertains to interpretation by the court. So I would not be opposed to taking further testimony on that piece at a later date, but going forward with this bill with the first instance of amendment. Thank you. Um, any other comments on um, any other comments? I'm going to unmute us all for, for, for a little bit here. Um, and David, if I can, I'm going to go to a, I'm going to go to um, I know, David, if you could stop sharing your screen, then we can, I can see everybody at once here. Thank you. Um, so let's, um, cause I'm mindful of the time that it's 2.02 right now. And um, <laughs> do we have any other further comments on S333 at this point in time in terms of what the amendments are and what's in front of us? I mean, essentially, you know, we are at a point where Again, I think I think once we get possession of this bill, we're looking to turn it around pretty quickly. Um, hopefully, by the end of this week, so that the Senate, so that we can get it to the our floor next week. Um, so, thoughts right now? I don't see anybody raising their hands right at this minute. Um, Representative Kalaki. Well, you know, we're we're working on emergency legislation now, and it's trying to keep people in their homes. And so, I think the two amendments add just clarity for the intention of what we're doing. And I'm comfortable with both of them. I'm hesitant to wait uh, further because the longer we wait, it has to go back to the Senate with these minute changes. And, you know, it's the, the, the emergency stay may be over by the time we get through this. And this is only for now to respond. And if the emergency continues for months, we'll have to go back and rethink everything. So I'm actually really comfortable with the work we have. I would hope that we could make, send these slight tweaks back to the Senate. The Senate's here listening to us um, as soon as we can vote. And so that we can next week get this to the governor's desk. We're trying to protect people. So uh, I think any, has it, any lengthening and getting more testimony is not right for this bill at this point. So I'm very comfortable with the, the work we've done and the agreements that everyone has thus far. So for me, both amendments seem clarifying and with the same intention of what we, what the Senate and the House have been working on. Okay, Representative Triano. Uh, am I, I'm on, I'm muted. Um, you're so you're I, good. I would concur with that. Um, uh, the clarification on the mobile home piece uh, was uh, pretty obvious and, um, and acceptable. And I think the last discussion surrounding the uh, uh, unoccupied uh, dwellings um, uh, clarified it for me uh, to a point where I, I would be ready to accept that as well. I think that um, uh, the way Sue described um, litigation in these matters, that um, there are certain considerations surrounding uh, a lot of the issues that we're concerned about, um, and that I would support both amendments at this time as well. Representative Howard. Um, thank you. I concur with what um, Representative Kalaki um, has said. Um, I think we need to uh, protect Vermonters and I think we need to do it um, thoughtfully and as quickly as possible. I personally have a dilapidated 
home in our my district and I've been trying for years to get it uh, taken care of. So um, I am in favor of this and I, I, I think we should proceed. Thank you. Hey, Representative Hengo. Thank you. Um, I guess I read the second amendment wrong. Um, so I'm okay with it. I really, I, I'm still a little bit confused as to the explanation that was given to us, but um, in reading the, the Second Amendment, I'm okay with that, and I, I'm going to withdraw my original comments because I think I'm okay with it. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Representative Walls? Uh, I agree with everything. Am I unmuted? You're all set. Okay. I agree with everything that's been said, and I agree with Representative Hango. Uh, I think some of the discussion we had on that second motion was very confusing, uh, but I think as printed, it's pretty clear, and I fully support that in the first instance of, of uh, amendment, and so I'm, I'm in favor of moving this thing along. Okay, thank you. Um, Representative Byron. You need to unmute yourself. Just there you wanted go. to echo what everyone else was saying, was supporting mm -hmm. the two amendments, um, especially uh, knowing and understanding the uh, federal protections that tenants have when uh, commercial property is transferred with maintaining their leases and then also having a uh, multi-month process should, of protection should they actually be on a month to month as opposed to a traditional one lease structure. So given that, that gives me peace of mind moving forward with that component. Thank you. Um, anyone else from committee? All right, thank you. Um, so David, if you can, um, hold on a second. Um, I think, um, David, I think the answer, um, if you could, if you could make the adjustments to the bill um, that were presented today, um, the, which would take care of, it would delete the word unoccupied from the Marcotte Amendment. It would, because this would over, this would overwrite, I think is what we're getting at is that the, the concerns of the, of legal aid was that, was that it it would be too broad that this narrowing would be the accurate one. Um, and so, uh, so if you could present a draft that would include those, you know, that, that amendment or the two amendments that we talked about today, and then that would be um, what we will be taking up when we have that opportunity um, sometime this week. And, and, and we're going to find out from leadership when we have we may have to meet together uh, after the floor tomorrow um, at some point or after whether it was after the morning floor or after the afternoon floor and um, and be able to take an official vote on this. So if we could get that version ready for tomorrow, that would I, be great. I really, may I please ask a clarifying question? Yes, you may. Yep. So if I hear you correctly, then you want the first both the first and the second instances of amendment as proposed today. And then from the Marcotte amendment, you want the green language that clarifies the timing. Correct. Is that right? Correct. So it would be three instances of amendment. Correct. The two that we have today plus. Because this second amend the second instance of amendment today overwrites it's the the first instant from the Marcotte, which is the just the simply the word unoccupied. Well, so yes, the, the second instance of, of amendment from today significantly narrows the scope of what happens to unoccupied properties under this bill. Mm -hmm. So the Marcotte would be across the board. This bill does not apply to unoccupied property versus the second instance of amendment from today, which says in a pending action against an unoccupied property, foreclosure sales, motions for confirmation, and confirmation orders may proceed. 
-hmm. That's so what we heard. The, you want the narrower? I think that's what it, we just weighed in on. Okay, got it. I agree. Can I yeah. ask for that to be repeated, please? Because yeah. I'm still, I'm, I'm still not clear. I need to see it in writing, I guess, um, both ways. Sorry. So, what we, what we, what we talked about last week with the so-called Marcotte Amendment ended up being that one word. Unoccupied. In the definition. Where in that bill is Unoccupied. I'm looking for it and can't find it. We just we just saw it a moment ago, David. If you want to put that yeah, back up on screen, please. Up, yeah, up yeah. Like. Just give me a line number, please. Um it's right there. Subdivision three. Right. So that's the broader of the two approaches to unoccupied dwelling, yes. right? This applies across the board, new actions, pending actions. It says, when we refer to foreclosure actions in this bill, we are not talking about properties that are unoccupied. Those would not be affected in any way by this bill. That is the very broad Marcotte proposal. Okay. And then under this proposal from today, in the second instance of amendment, this is much narrower. This says in a pending action that involves an unoccupied property, a foreclosure sale, a motion for confirmation, or a confirmation order can continue. Mm -hmm. So that's much narrower in scope. Everybody have that? I, I guess I'm still not seeing why it's narrower. I, the, the first, the first bill that we agreed to last week is talking about a dwelling that is being occupied. And I understand why we don't want to foreclose on an occupied dwelling. But now we're proposing to talk about unoccupied dwellings, which in my mind, I'm okay with unoccupied dwellings being allowed to go through with the proceedings. I think the question, um, and Wendy, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but what I heard was that by, is that when dealing, especially with out of state um, foreclosure proceedings or, or things that start there, that they can happen in a way that, that, that they, may go against the building that's already occupied or that they it's you know given that there's a covid crisis or or that that rooms may be homes may be unoccupied but these out of state police places are going to start a process and call it occupied and then these confirmation of orders if i'm not mistaken is proving that they're what they say they are is that true wendy like you're afraid that there's going to be a place where somebody is actually occupying their place they are residents in their place that should be protected under the stays that have been proposed mm -hmm. that, but that a group would say, no, that's not true. This is unoccupied simply because they're isolating someplace else. Correct. And that the only information, um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yes. And that the only information the court is getting is getting from the person who wants to proceed with the foreclosure. And that's, that's our concern because it may not really be unoccupied, even though the person isn't there at, at the exact moment when somebody goes to check, um, that, that you have it right. And, and that this information, I'm sorry, go ahead. That's okay. Can, can Sue please weigh in on that exact sentence that you just said, Wendy? 
Go ahead, Sue, you're on. I, I'll be glad to. Um, I think what Wendy is talking about does not happen. I have never seen it happen. I've been practicing for 30 years. My practice is almost exclusively um, foreclosures and creditor workouts. And I just do not see that happen. I, the big out of state lenders proceed with each case as if the property is occupied and um, sometimes even leave the mortgage or there for months after the foreclosure auction has taken place. Um, and I absolutely, in my experience, the courts will scrutinize those affidavits and they will look for real evidence that the person um, has moved out permanently. They will look at things, um, are, have the utilities been placed in the bank's name? Yeah. Is mail, um, uh, have the utilities been term, turned off? Is, how, are the pipes broken, uh, frozen, excuse me? Um, are appliances removed? Is there no food in the property? Um, are there rodents running through it? All of those types of things. Um, and and that's, that's really uh, the bank's concerns. Okay, thank you. That's why I was concerned about having the courts weigh in for testimony on this. And that's what I heard earlier, but then I was getting very mixed messages. So um, no, I'm not okay with the second instance of amendment. And I apologize for my confusion, but this is totally new law for me. But, yes, Representative Kalaki. But Sue, you you agree with the Second Amendment. It was your language you agreed to. So I, that's where the confusion is for me. Like, you've agreed to this. We've agreed to the Second Amendment, but not striking the word unoccupied. The Second Amendment was for purpose of clarification that um, to really direct the courts um, it, clearly, yes, please go forward with these proceedings. Um, but striking the word unoccupied, which I don't think the Second Amendment does. No. So the Second Amendment without the word unoccupied being stricken is fine and it's it's maybe just superfluous, but it provides cl clarification. So you have, but you support it. Right, wait, 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 wait. I'm all right. I'm now. I'm, I'm confused. All right. So now, so now I'm confused because because what what was in the definition, what was proposed to be struck was the phrase which is occupied, back to the the dwelling house, right? The, that it was attached to dwelling house, which is occupied. This language here, um, and I think what David's getting at is either, it's either going to be which is a dwelling house, which is occupied, or it's going to be this secondary, this second amendment language, which is, which narrows it and which says the word unoccupied. So which, which one are we talking about here? I mean, it, because you know that I have a note here that says, if if the if we you if we stay with what we agreed to last week, it's broad, and it is um, and it makes this narrowing uh, unnecessary. Right. It's I would I would I would I would agree with that. If you stay with what was agreed to last week. Um, this amendment is unnecessary. This but amendment this was... would be a last, re a last resort if, um, if you agree to strike unoccupied, then this amendment would be a last resort to at least allow us to proceed with the very end of some of these pending cases. But I, I'm sorry, striking the words unoccupied from this second amendment? Or, no, or, or the phrase it. which is occupied from the definition. From the definition, I'm sorry. I apologize, I wasn't clear. Yes, if unoccupied is stricken from the definition of foreclosure. No, that's not in the definition. The no. definition of foreclosure says which is occupied. That was the proposed language to be struck. Dwelling house which is occupied. I, okay, I, I'm sorry, I misspoke. The which is occupied, if that language is stricken, 
then I believe the second um, amendment proposal is absolutely necessary to allow just these minimal um, wrapping up matters to conclude. Okay, so, so that's a tacit agreement that the second amendment as proposed today is acceptable. If the words which is occupied is disc is taken away from the definition in uh, for for that's attached to the word dwelling house. Is that what I'm hearing you say? That is it, that is uh, sort of our hail mary pass to at least be able to do something. That language right. is acceptable if the committee decides we you know that you think which is occupied should be stricken from the definition okay that's this, where this, this that's, gives that's, at least the bank some ability to do which we want it to be able to do right which is what we want so i'm going to go to representative walls i'm getting a little uh, just senate thank you for sitting in um representative walls i don't find the two statements incompatible at all i would recommend we leave them both in the barcott amendment says we're not taking action against any occupation, uh, against any dwelling that is occupied. Right. Clear statement. And then the second amendment today says, in the case of unoccupied, so that's a different set, in the case of unoccupied dwellings, which have reached a certain point, we specifically, specifically are allowing certain procedures to go forward. But I don't find them inconsistent at all. They're completely different Venn diagrams, if you will. I would leave them both in. All right, Representative Hango, and then I want to get a clarification from, uh, from, from, from David. If that's the case, like Representative Waltz just said, that to me makes a lot more sense because I absolutely cannot follow the reasoning that has been presented to me as to one versus the other. And this is a continuing problem in my mind when other people besides us are writing bills and amendments um, because I don't know where they're coming from and I don't have the institutional knowledge of legal tenant landlord law to really get into the weeds like this. So I'm totally frustrated and hopefully David will concur with Representative Waltz. Thank you. Yes. Well, without, you know, without greasing the wheel any further, David, what were your thoughts about what, what Representative Waltz was, was saying? Is that? Um, all due respect, uh, it's the sec, <laughs> can may I share my screen? It might help. Just you can you share your screen because I can barely see you. So, um, you're, right. you're, there you go. Yes, please share your screen. There you go. There's you. Um, but please share your screen. So, are you seeing, um, are you seeing Marcotte juxtaposed with House General? Yes. 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 Okay. So, I, I I think what we need to do is just take two steps back and remember what this bill does, right? This bill, as far as foreclosures are concerned, establishes a moratorium on foreclosure actions, whether they are new, whether they are already pending. It says hit pause, right? Mm -hmm. The debate you are having right now concerning foreclosures is the extent to which you want to create an exception for unoccupied properties. If you go with the Marcotte proposal, you are making a blanket exception for unoccupied properties against mm -hmm. from the rule. You understand? Mm -hmm. Under S3, let me say it back. Under S333, 333, you are creating this new rule. Foreclosure actions across the board, pending or new, will not proceed until the emergency period ends. And again, the scope of this debate is what exception to that rule are you going to make for unoccupied properties? Under the Marcotte proposal, you're making a blanket exception to that rule across the board for unoccupied properties. You are saying 
that as you're defining foreclosure, that term doesn't mean uh, an unoccupied property. It only means an action brought against a dwelling house that is occupied. Therefore, if it's not occupied, it's not a foreclosure action as far as this bill is concerned. And none of the pause happens for those. You understand? You can keep a pending action going. You can start a new action. You can issue orders. You can issue service. You can, uh, you can issue writs of possession. You can have judicial sales. You can have confirmation orders. You can do anything if the property is unoccupied. Unoccupied. That's right. what the Marcotte Amendment does. Mm -hmm. so that is as broad as it gets as far as unoccupied property goes. The language from today, what's in yellow on your screen, is significantly narrow, significantly narrower than that in many ways, right? First off, it only applies to pending actions. Second off, it only applies to the very tail end of those pending actions. You, are, you have gone through the whole thing and you've already got a sale going or you've completed the sale and you want a, 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 a approval of a confirmation of the sale and you want an order from the court that wraps everything up, right? So whereas that Marcotte amendment is as broad as it gets for unoccupied properties, the language today only applies to pending actions against unoccupied properties that are at the point of sale or beyond, okay? And the reason that you don't need both, um, and both would be confusing, is that if you take the Marcotte language, you are saying as a matter of law, the things that today's language references aren't gonna happen anyway. They aren't at issue. You can do anything with a foreclosure. Therefore, you don't need to make a carve out for sales, motions, confirmation orders, because they aren't paused. And so the reason that, that, that Sue is saying, yes, I, I, I agree to both is because she's not sure what you're going to do. And if you're not going to do the Marcotte, then she wants to at least be able to deal with sales and confirmations in pending actions against unoccupied properties. But what she would prefer is the broader construct under which they can proceed with foreclosure actions as long as the property is unoccupied. Okay. Representative Walsh. Let me respectfully disagree with you, uh, David, uh, because Marcotte Amendment specifically says this applies only to occupied dwellings. And the Second Amendment from today specifically says it applies only to unoccupied dwellings. So I think we're dealing with two completely different sets here. And I honestly don't see any confusion whatsoever. I, Tommy, to, uh, to David's point, I think, or to the point of the Marcotte Amendment, I think, uh, and, uh, is that it's by leaving unoccupied unmentioned that, or it's just by specifying the occupied that unoccupied material is goes off on right on what's already been set up as opposed to um, not affected. So I, yes, I think the Second Amendment then addresses that. Well, keep, uh, keep in mind that, am I muted? No. Um, keep in mind that um, the Second Amendment pertains only to uh, proceedings that are already in progress. So that's a, a considerable difference between the two. Right. Right. It's a different set of properties and it's a, no, it's it's a different, different set of procedures, procedures at, at which point this uh, um, this uh, would uh, these amendments would uh, would kick into the court system. Right, but the other def the, the other difference is that this, this is that the, the Marcotta the Marcotta amendment deals with a definition. So whenever that word is yeah. then used, it's used in this manner for this period of time. Whereas the second piece of, a, of of amendment under the under the yellow print here is that it's about a particular action. It falls in a different place. Right in in the in the in, in the in what we're proposing. So it, it, you know, by by keeping the definition broad under the Marcotte piece, we're we're making what what I hear David say is that the second piece is irrelevant because 
Um, right. Be, because be, because we defined the word so broadly at the beginning. I would disagree with that because as uh, Representative Troiano just pointed out, what the Second Amendment does says in these specific instances, can we take action against unoccupied? It's not wide open to do anything you want with unoccupied uh, property, but only in these specific instances. Hey, Representative Hango. Representative Hango. I'm going to defer to Representative Gamash for a minute because she's been trying to say something and then I'll speak. <laughs> okay, go okay. ahead, Mariana. Representative Gamash. Uh, okay, I have to. You, you're, can we you, can hear can you. Can you hear me? Can you yep. hear me? Yes. Okay, so I have concluded after first thinking I understood, then being very confused, <laughs> and after after hearing D David's summary or explanation, I have, I can see where the Marcotte Amendment addresses one issue and the, and the Second Amendment here in this language addresses a, a different issue. Right. As David said, the whole idea of unoccupied uh, is not in the Marcotte Amendment. It, it's as if it doesn't exist because the, 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 it was meant only to ensure that people who lived in occupied buildings would be covered. So when you have an unoccupied building, there are no tenants in there. It doesn't matter. It's a whole category that is not in the Marcotte Bill. Well, the Marcotte Amendment. So it's it's as if it doesn't exist. So what's your point? Do you want my this? point is personally, I like the Marcotte Amendment. Personally. Okay, so you're not I, thinking that the Second Amendment needs to also be in like, No, is that because it the, the Second Amendment only deals with one part of of that. It's it's only a portion of the process. So, Whereas in the Marcon Amendment, unoccupied is not dealt with at all. So it's, it's like there's a carve out, except that wouldn't be correct because it's not a carve out, but it doesn't, it doesn't exist. It's a, it's a different category. It's like apples and oranges. It isn't apples and oranges, but I don't know how else to, it's just, it's two different entities, two, and, two different things. One refers to occupied, one refers to unoccupied, and we're trying to take care of and ensure that people who live in occupied dwellings are going to be protected. The other thing, when a building is in a process of being uh, foreclosed upon, if it is occupied, if there are tenants, any tenants, in a building, be it residential or commercial, those tenants have to be notified that there is a foreclosure proceeding that is starting or is at some point, somewhere along the line, tenants have to know this building is going into foreclosure at some point so that they're put on notice. So whether they are, and, and there's a procedure for that in terms of responding, it's, it's not like, Somebody can just go in, um, tack a foreclosure sign on a, on a dwelling or on a, a building um, and not give any information to the tenants. They have to be apprised of what their rights are, first of all. So even if someone is not occupied, somebody has a lease or they're on a, a 30 day, month to month. Even on a month to month, you cannot on the 30th day of that month to month say to the tenant, um, pack your stuff and be out of here in the morning. We, we, have, we have laws to protect people. Um, so, it, so I guess what I'm getting at is that when there's a building 
where a foreclosure procedure is starting. Very quickly in the, those first steps, if you will, if the building is occupied in any way, be it by one tenant or by multiple tenants, they have to be notified. So even if they, even if somebody gets ill, does it, is not in that place, is somewhere else, notification still has to be given to them. So, I, and I'm not apprised of the law as to the various forms. It used to be people were mm. a, 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 um, notified by, by mail, by return mail, um, so that they were assured that that the notification arrived. We have multiple means of notifying people today. So I don't really know what the law is currently. Um, hey, Mar so Mariana, whether, or not you're, whether or not you're physically there, if you, if you are a tenant, whether you're there or you're physically someplace else, you still need to be not, notified. So the tenants are included in that respect. So. Okay, so they I'm going to be protected. No, no, I uh, yeah. So we're still at this point. I'm gonna. I have to pause now. It's two thirty-seven, and and I just want to. Um. So David, I'm. I mean, I, we've heard arguments on all sides of this right now, and I'm not sure we're ready to make that decision in this minute. So I want to. I just want to spend the rest of this 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 twenty-three minutes, twenty-two minutes, because we all have to go in a different Zoom meeting after this. Um. And I want to bring the Senate into this um, conversation. I've unmuted everybody, not just to specifically about this conversation, um, but um, the reason I asked the Senate to join us was A, to listen to this discussion as we're trying to wrap this up, but also to um, 